Thank you so much for joining us this morning or afternoon or whatever you may be, you know, watching this recording. Uh, today we have Steam Lead Judge Greg Holman, uh, a good friend of mine, and we're just so happy to have him um, on the show today. <laughs> uh, oh, celebrating Oklahoma City Latino Film Festival, our seventh annual Oklahoma City Latino Film Festival, virtual this year, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, so Greg, please tell us about yourself and a little bit about your background. Thank you, Rogelio. I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is my first time being a judge for the festival, and I've, I have enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm, I watched the full-length documentaries and the full-length uh, feature films, um, and yeah, it was a lot of content to watch, but I very much enjoyed it because I got to see content that not many people you know, get to see, and uh, even things that even our festival goers uh, won't get to see. Um, so it was a lot of fun to see the creativity, the different perspectives, and to see the different stories, whether fiction or nonfiction, that are coming to us from all over the world. And uh, so it's for me, it's an honor to be able to help with this. Um, and you know, it's it, the the festival already has such a good reputation and a good legacy and a good history. So for me to be involved for the first time like this, um, it's an honor. I've been involved in the past with little things, but nothing as, as big as this. So, um, so yeah, I, I was very honored to be asked. And uh, yeah, I, I wanna make sure that I can do anything I, I can to help the, to make sure the festival always um, lives on forever. You know, we, we want our kids and grandkids to, to work on this too, right? And um, so in terms of telling you about myself, well, I was born and raised here in South Oklahoma City. Um, I was born 40 years ago here in South Oklahoma City when Oklahoma City was very different. You know, still there were a lot of Hispanics, obviously, in, on this side of town, still are, and there were even back then. But, you know, there were no Hispanic grocery stores. Um, you know, there were, there were very few Mexican restaurants, and they were mainly more Tex-Mex. We didn't have any taco places. We didn't have any Mexican ice cream shops. We didn't have... We had one Mexican bakery that I can remember um, on, on Central near 25th and Shields. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously our community has grown a lot and there's been a lot of changes. And the fact that we have a festival now speaks to just how much uh, our, our community is growing, our own film festival that with people um, submitting from all around the world and, wa and now watching from all around the world or watching our festival. So, my hats off to you and Rogelio and everyone on the team for making this happen. Uh, what a special, um, what a special uh, part of our community this is, and uh, something that will be remembered for generations to come. And yeah, I mean, I could talk, I could talk to you, um, I could talk a lot about um, my background, right? But um, in terms of how it's related specifically to this festival and to historic Capitol Hill, Calle Dos Cinco, is that. Um, as a kid, you know, we would spend a lot of time uh, in Capitol Hill, whether it's going to a grocery store or um, I know that when I was, I remember as a kid going to Christmas Connection back then, um, there was a nonprofit in, back in the 80s, there was a nonprofit um, called Christmas Connection uh, in Capitol Hill where low-income families would go and uh, the, the kids wouldn't know, but they were basically picking out Christmas toys that, um, you know, would eventually maybe end up under their Christmas tree and um, you know, so it was, it's, uh, it was, um, it's still around, right? And it's a wonderful program that helps low-income families to make sure that they have uh, Christmas gifts for their kids. So I remember doing that as a child. Um, I remember going to, uh, then as a teenager, I would, uh, I went to uh, Cocina Azteca, which is now Taqueria El Milagro on 25th and Robinson, um, owned by the Arzate family, and uh, just great tacos and tortas and stuff on, on 25th and Robinson there at Cocina Azteca and the Arzate family as well as the Gallegos family were very involved in the community. In the late 90s, I remember there was once a, a parade that happened in Capitol Hill called the Selena Anti-Violence Rally. And what it was, it was, you know, it was shortly after Selena had died, um, you know, being murdered. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about um, the role that violence was playing in our community, guns. Um, so the idea was we need to have a rally to raise awareness about 
why um, you know th these kind of, these kind of things are happening in our community to make sure that um, you know we, we, we that everybody in the community knows how much how valuable life is, how short life is, how precious life is, and how there should be no place for violence in, in our community. Um, so you know we, it was a, there was a parade. I was uh, we had a makeshift stage on a flatbed trailer, and I was uh, I was in one of the MCs, and um, I mean, we had. Uh, the folkloric dance group uh, Norawa Baile Folklorico was there because you know they've been in part of our community for decades. So even in the late '90s, you know they were already well known and performing a lot. Um, yeah, it was just a lot of people involved, a lot of fun, and uh, you know it really it was really special to see our community come together. Um, you know, and it was it, if you look if you could go back in time and see it, it was very humble. You know, like there wasn't uh, you know tons of vendors and there weren't tons of sponsors but it was organic it was grassroots and it was for a good cause so i've kind of seen a little bit of the evolution and of capitol hill and my dad he's from originally from oklahoma oklahoma city and he, he even spent a lot of time in capitol hill his mother uh, my grandmother would always talk to me when she was alive about what life was like in capitol hill in the 1940s and 50s she tell me stories about the Capitol Hill Bakery. And one of the most important things that I can say probably about her family is that her grandfather was the first uh, justice of the peace in, in Capitol Hill back in 1907, uh, back when Capitol Hill first started. And so the justice of the peace sort of was like the sheriff of Capitol Hill and he had like a badge and he had a gun. And, and every, back then in 1907, everybody was still um, riding horses and, and things of that nature, you know, in carriages and what have you. So it was very common up, up and down Capitol Hill to see horses tied up, people going into to the businesses. He had a business in Capitol Hill. Uh, his name was G.F. Walker. And uh, so it's crazy to think that, you know, on my, on, on my dad's side of the family, you know, we, our history goes way back to the very beginning of Capitol Hill. And when my mom and dad were dating in the 70s, they would go to what you know to the Yale Theater back then. They would play Mexican movies. They would, they used to go watch Vicente Fernandez movies in Spanish in the seventies in South Oklahoma City, uh, when, uh, and, uh, you know when they were just boyfriend and girlfriend when they were dating. So yeah, just have I have a special place in my heart for Capitol Hill. Wow, that just I mean that it's just amazing. <laughs> I mean so much history, so much history <laughs> in Capitol Hill, and it's so cool that you know. Um, all this history and then you're gonna you're gonna be able to pass this along to your kids and um but yeah i didn't i didn't know about your your great 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 grandfather you know being yeah. the, uh, the justice uh <laughs> oh yeah the the cherry justice of peace. yeah justice and, of peace. and that's why you know so a lot of, a lot of times people when they see me they they don't know that i'm actually half white and half mexican right and you can tell from my last name right um so yeah on my dad's side on the holman side and actually on the, the Love Lady Walker side is was where we have the, the long connection with Capitol Hill. And even on my Hallman side too, like, you know, like for example, my, my grandfather, he lived in Capitol Hill and I, we have newspaper articles referring to his home in Capitol Hill, like when he got married and when he was in Italy stationed uh, during World War II stationed in Italy um, with the army, um, you know, to, and it said that he's a native of Capitol Hill. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's 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 really cool to be able to say that, and and then even even on my mom's side, on the on the Mexican side of my family, it's still kind of you could say that it's been a long time too that we sort of have a long history with Capitol Hill because it goes back to the late seventies and the eighties. Um, so, so it's you know and something another quick story too. My dad in the sixties when he was young, uh, when he was still in elementary school, he would take trumpet and drum lessons at a building called the International Order of Odd Fellows building, which is kind of like the, um, oh, like the Rotary or the Lions Club. And, uh, you know, it was like a social, uh, like a fraternity for social good or like a, a nonprofit. And you can still see the building there. It says I-O-O-F um, on the side of the building. So it stands for the International Order of Odd Fellows. So they would give music lessons to the community. So my dad, you know, learned the basics of, of drumming and trumpet there. Uh, just a long history, you know, going to buy clothes at Langston when he was a kid, Langston. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to look at old pictures and to see 
how much Capitol Hill has changed. And it's also fun to think about where we're going, the future of Capitol Hill. And that's where I'm gonna, you know, kind of segue into my next question to you, Mr. Holman. Um, how do you became involved in, in, in Capitol Hill uh, with, um, with Calle Dos Cinco and then what the things that you're doing there now and then uh, with the film festival? So, you know, um, our, 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 we, have a, we have a really good friend in common, Jorge Hernandez, Jorge and Brenda Hernandez, um, our friends. Um, they, as you, you know, as you know already, and a lot of people out there know, um, they're the ones that started the Fiestas de las Americas um, festival. And um, so, you know, I used to work for Jorge and Brenda. I used to work for Jorge and Brenda um, at Tango Public Relations. And um, when I worked at Tango PR, which is how you and I met, met too, right, at Tango PR, um, that's uh, whenever, you know, they were working on the festival. So I helped with the festival um, by, through, through Tango PR, I was involved with the festival. Also, uh, while, while I was at Tango PR, I helped um, Capitol Hill, I helped Jorge and Brendan and the Capitol Hill board get their first business improvement district designation through the city of Oklahoma City, what, you know, what's called the BID, B-I-D. Um, and I remember Jorge and I, you know, walking up and down the streets, getting all these signatures from property owners, trying to spread the word about why getting a bid is a good idea. And that was like 2006, 2007. Um, so even before, even before Facebook existed publicly, before the iPhone existed, we were out there um, trying to uh, get support, um, helping Capitol Hill to build the bid district that they have today. Um, so I learned even more about where we are, you know, where we were at that point, which is very similar to where we are now um, in terms of, you know, property owners and and the the, the dynamics of the of the area. And of course, I'm talking about the business district area of, of Capitol Hill, basically, you know, Southwest 25th Street, mainly between Walker and Shields. Um, so, so that's how I first got started, got involved with uh, with Capitol Hill. And then along the way, you know, when I no longer worked at Tango PR and, you know, went on to do other things, you know, working as a classroom teacher or what have you. Um, I then at that point, um, of some, some years later, Donna Cervantes, was the executive director and Mayor Mortega, they both uh, asked if I would be interested in, in being on the board. And of course, you know, like I said, I mean, because of the long and deep connection I have with Capitol Hill, it, it was an honor and still an honor to be on the board. So uh, I've been a board member now, oh, for, se for several years, um, as I was already on the board whenever um, Donna had left her position to go to the city of Oklahoma City and when we hired Gloria Torres. And uh, so that was, uh, uh, you know, just an exciting time. And I was so, so overwhelmingly happy that, um, that we were able to hire her uh, because, you know, she has kept the, the district strong, keeps it growing, um, you know, because it, it looks easier than what it is, right? I mean, and it's very easy to think that, oh yeah, well, Capitol Hill's doing well, we expect it to do well. But to me, it's so fragile. It's, it, not just Capitol Hill as an association and these events, but just the development in general, urban development, commercial development. To me, it's very fragile. All it takes is one person here ignoring and not caring, another person over there not doing their part. And the next thing you know, Capitol Hill is left behind. And, you know, it's overcome with weeds, um, broken windows everywhere. So it takes, it takes a lot of effort to, to at the very least maintain the, the, the polish and the shine of a district. And so, so that's why I say, you know, my hat's off to everyone else on the board. Um, my hat's off to Gloria, um, all the business owners, um, all of the property owners, the city of Oklahoma City, everybody involved for doing their part. Um, I'm very thankful to each and every one of them because uh, it could just as easily be the opposite. We could be talking about Capitol Hill and uh, in, in a very different way. Um, but that history, so the historical preservation, the, the, the excitement about what is yet to come, the things that, um, you know, get coming through this pandemic, it's going to be historic. And when people go look, look back on this, I know that they're going to say, wow, what a time of growth. And this is a great district. I need to put my business there or we need to have dinner down there. 
Um, you know, I, I got to go to that event coming up. It's going to be awesome. Um, so yeah, that, I, it's going to happen. I, I have high hopes for, for Capitol Hill that we will continue to have this progress. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of that, uh, to add to that, you know, having a film festival in historic Capitol Hill, Calle Dos Cinco, and to me, it was a very, uh, if not the most important time of the festival last year. I think we reached a milestone by having the film festival at the Yale Theater. Can you speak to that and what importance it is to have a film festival, a Latino film festival in historic Capitol Hill? Oh, yes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not only, yeah, it's, it's very symbolic, right? Um, I, and you, I love what the owners of the Yale Theater have done um, in terms of uh, not just how aesthetically pleasing and the, um, the overall feel of the design, because you know it also harkens back to um, to to uh, a golden age, right? Like when you when you're in the Yale Theater and you see the um, you know different nuances in terms of uh, the colors or symbols, lines, it makes you think of the 40s, it makes you think of the 50s. And you know, it's often considered in Mexico and in the United States, the golden age of cinema, right? And, um, and so, you know, I imagine the feeling of what it would have been like to go to see Gone with the Wind there or to go see uh, The Wizard of Oz at the Yale Theater, um, you know, lot, not long after it came out. Um, you know, just, just this, uh, this, you know, this feeling of nostalgia. Right, so they've done a great job in capturing that. And I was I was once talking to Steve Mason about it. I said I love the Art Deco touches. Wouldn't you say it's Art Deco? And he says, Well, it is what you think it is. Like whatever it speaks to, what it what whatever it evokes in your mind and in your heart, that's what we're trying to evoke. And and it certainly helped, you know, helped me feel that way that this is a a certain time of of. Of, 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 of the United States, a certain time of our city. Um, when, you know, it makes me think about, about that time of the golden age of cinema, right? Um, so not only have they done a good job in, in the aesthetics, but they've also done a phenomenal job in programming um, the, the, the events that they've had there at the Yale Theater, opening it up to the community, um, being generous with their resources, being generous with their time, being flexible, um, you know, it's it's amazing, and uh, you know, I, I, again, I think when we look back on this, um, you know, we're going to remember their role in Capitol Hill uh, as as playing a huge role because you know it's it's a landmark. Um, it was a landmark years before, and it still is, and it's going to continue to be a landmark. And uh, you know, it kind of symbolizes our district as a whole, you know, where we've gone, where we are, where we were, um, you know, the, the timeline, right? And, um, and, and, and it's been there, you know, for years. Um, and, you know, the, I've just, they've done a phenomenal job restoring the colors that they've chosen, everything like outside, inside, amazing. And the, the, the support that they've given to the community as well, very amazing. And, you know, I know it wasn't cheap, so it, it says a lot that they felt so strongly about this area and this community that they would invest not only financially, but also of their time, invest um, their heart and soul into this project. So yeah, they, they've set, certainly uh, set a standard. They're a, um, uh, what they've done is exemplary and it's setting an example for, for everybody else in the district. And yeah, I, I think that there's gonna, we're gonna see more projects like that for sure. Oh no, and I love that. I love going driving to to Capitol Hill and then just seeing the Yale Theater, and I, we just can't wait to go back to it next year because I, I believe uh, very uh, dearly in my heart that we will come back to in-person events, and that the um, Occasion okay, Latino 2022, the eighth edition, will be back at the Yale Theater. And so yes, we're super excited yes. about that. And all the things that are coming to the district. I mean, it's just the amazing of all the growth that's coming to the district. Um, so circle you back. know, Roy. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Roy, but you know that's not that's not to take away from how the festival started. Obviously, the festival wasn't always in the movie theater, right? And I think that's kind of what you were getting at with your question too. Um, to be able to finally make it to to 
to that um, that that union of history and and um, and filmmaking and and you know going to going to the theater and to a movie theater this, this whole idea of cinema and with this film festival coming together you're right I mean it is it's a it's it's almost like a match made in heaven. It was and, like like you said it was very symbolic because we started at Capitol Hill at the basement of El Nacional back in 2014. Yes. Back in 2014, we started at the basement, and then we had to we we outgrew ourselves by the second year, so we had to to find a, a different location, and there were no locations in Capitol Hill that were able to host the film festival, and so we right. had to leave the, the district for the in-person festival. But then we we were now finally able to come back. You know, when they opened that old Triple C Capitol Hill Center, we did yeah. it there two years, and then finally last year we were able to come back to the Yale. So that was very not only symbolic, but it, it was like you said, it was just like a match made in heaven. It was what it was meant to be. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, not not to take away from the other places. Obviously, the the, the festival festivals of the past were were wonderful too. Um, it should, but there's just something special about how it came together last. Year. Absolutely, yes, yes. Okay, and now so now circling back to uh, the film festival and and kind of like the reason that we brought you back on, you know, to be a. A, a judge, you know, or a leading judge, it, it was because of your expertise and because of your knowledge and, and, and different background, you know, that you've developed over the years, of course. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, the films that have impacted your life. Oh, in general? Yes. Tell me like your top, okay. your top five films. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I wish I would have been prepared, you know, since uh, I, uh, I love, you know, I, I love movies a lot, you know, um, love going to, to the movies. My very, very first movie that I went to go see, so I'm going to list this. I'm going to list this as one of my top five. The very first movie that I remember seeing in the theater, in the movie theater, it was, it was at Crossroads Mall <laughs> in South Oklahoma City. And um, what eventually, I think it was, I think it was the, the, the theater that eventually became the dollar, the dollar uh, movies. But anyways, so this is so this is um, so I'm probably like maybe six or seven, maybe five. So I don't remember the exact year, but it was the year that E.T. was in theaters. Steven Spielberg, E.T. Extraterrestrial. Wow, um, my mind just exploded. <laughs> right to and, see E.T. in the movie theaters. Yeah, I, we saw. I, I remember seeing it in the movie theater, um, and. I, you know, it's just, you know, one of those things I vaguely remember, you know, the darkness, being with my parents, being like fascinated, like what is this animal, what is this alien on the screen, the, the, the sounds, the music, and Steven Spielberg, I mean, one of my favorite directors, hands down, you know, just hit after hit after hit, love his directing style, love his, the way he tells a story, and I love that, and he said this too, he, he said this many times in interviews, that when he makes a movie, he likes he likes for there to be childlike wonder in the in what he creates. Um, he likes to think of you know what what would it be like for a child to be watching this and you know the 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 suspension of disbelief, um, the mystery, the uh, again the the sense of awe. I certainly felt that being in the movie theater, and um, so yeah, I mean I I just love. My, I love being nostalgic and thinking about my childhood. I love the '80s. I love Steven Spielberg. So, yeah, it's one one of my favorite movies for sure. Um, you know, not like I, it's not like I have it memorized and I've seen it many times, but you know, it just reminds me of that special time in my life. You know, um, and and it reminds me of one of my favorite directors. And another one of my favorite directors is Robert Zemeckis. And Robert Zemeckis uh, directed one of my favorite movies. Uh, well, two of them really that I'm going to list on this on this list. Um, one is Forrest Gump. It's one of my favorite movies because you could kind of tell like I'm a little bit of a history buff, right? So I like you know especially U.S. history, and I've always liked this idea of sometimes when we see this in film where we see a character's entire life, right? It doesn't always happen in movies, but Every now and then there's a movie comes along where we see them as a child, we see them as adolescent, we see them as a teenager, a young adult, and you know, on into adulthood. And when whenever those narratives come through, sometimes uh, for me it's fascinating, right? Because I often think about my trajectory, right? Like where where I was, 
where I am, where I'm going, my kids, where they are, where, where they're going. Um, I want, you know, want to make their childhood as happy as my childhood was. Um, so, you know, when I think about a person's life, it's, it's very poignant, you know, it's very touching. It's very endearing to, to see where they've gone and what, where they've gone and where, and, and where they are, where they were. Um, I, you know, I think about my own family members. I mentioned my grandparents earlier. I love looking at pictures of them when they were, when they were younger, learning how they met, learning how they lived through the, through the depression, through the Dust Bowl here in Oklahoma, um, thinking about what life was like for them in the 70s, what life was like for my dad when he was a kid. Like, I'm just always fascinated by that. So Forrest Gump embodies that, right? You see, you see U.S. history throughout the decades, and you see this man's life from when he was young to when he was older. Uh, now, that movie is a movie that I have seen, I mean, just dozens of times. Um, where I did memorize all the dialogue. I used to, when Can I was- ask you, have you gone to Baba Gums? Yes, yep. Um, when, well, yeah, when, when, when my wife Nancy and I were dating, we went to Baba Gums and I just loved it, man. It was like perfect. And I could answer all the trivia questions, you know? And uh, so yeah, big, big Forrest Gump fan, um, big Robert Zemeckis fan. And then I'm also, I really like Back to the Future, probably for the same reasons. Um, in terms of, you know, there's this history involved. There's also the, the mystery and um, the, the, uh, the fascination with the future, right? So, you know, Back to the Future 2, um, you know, what they got right, what they pr accurately predicted. Um, whenever, so, you know, in the movie, Marty McFly and Doc Brown, you know, they go to the, they go to the, to the future. And the date in the future was October 21st, 2015. So on October 21st, 2015, I'm married, have kids. But I remember being a kid thinking, I wonder what it's gonna be like in October, on October 21st, 2015, are we gonna have all these things? And uh, most of them we did have from the movie, the prediction. So, um, so you know, we, we went to um, a back except, to the future. Except back. the hoverboard. Yeah, right. Except for the hoverboard, right? Not, not. We don't entirely have the hoverboard. No, unfortunately, we need that and the flying cars. But um, so you know, the back, to, the back to the future. Future on that day, on October twenty first, two thousand fifteen, um, my wife and kids, we ordered the pizza from the movie, just like the Pizza Hut. Obviously, it wasn't the the small um, <laughs> dehydrated pizza. We got the regular size pizza. I have, I have a Pepsi cup. Uh, the the Pepsi Clear, no, not Pepsi Clear. Uh, what was it called? Like a oh, Pepsi Perfect, Pepsi Perfect from the future. Like it was like this bottle uh, with a weird shape, with its with a unique shape. I, I you know I have one of those because you know Pepsi released um, some of those cups um, you know before the anniversary or whatever. And uh, so yeah, I mean, so I'm a big fan of Back to the Future. I have Back to the Future T-shirts. Um, you know, I could watch that movie over and over and over again. And I, now it's fun showing, sharing that movie with. With my kids, um, other movies, man. There's there's so many movies that I could mention, and that all and the reasons that they're special. Um, oh, definitely love Home Alone. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not like it's a a uh, Criterion, you know, top top film, you know, that everybody's going to remember because it's so you know well. Uh, directed and it's not like the best cinematography no right but it's special just for sentimental reasons um in terms of uh you know my family um you know my mom and dad me being a kid my brothers when we were kids you know we'd watch that movie and over over and over again you know so it's very very christmasy you know very family friendly and funny obviously and you know we still watch it now and i could i could watch that movie over and over again and have watched it dozens of times yeah, so, especially you know, during the holidays, it's kind of like a family movie. It brings exactly those back that nostalgia. Yes, and it makes me just happy. And I, I, I see even my, even like my mom especially likes watching it, and it, it's it's it, there's automatic happiness. You know, it reminds me of, of the '90s, and you know, I'm, I'm I love thinking about and reliving the '90s. So, um, so yeah, so I would definitely put that on my list, and I should probably list a movie that is well respected in terms of. Um, like in terms of filmmaking as, as an art, right? Um, in terms of directing, in terms of uh, maybe cinematography, editing, um, I need to come up with a good movie that speaks to that as well. Um, and there's a lot out there, of course. 
And so, so you know, I, I think, or well, I think of Shawshank Redemption. I think of, um, yeah, definitely. That's a really good one. Really good one. Right. I, I should come. I should come up with something too. That's like Oscar, like Gravity. I, you know, love the way that was that was made uh, with Sandra Bullock. Um, the Revenant. Yeah, I could probably watch The Revenant over and over again. And also, what's cool about about these films is that they're Mexican films that that were able to make the crossover. That you know, they got respect and have been lauded worldwide. So not just um, movies that were popular in Mexico and got awards in Mexico, but um, just perfect films, the way it was executed, the soundtrack, the acting, Gravity, The Revenant, among other movies are perfect films. And so beautiful, so well-made, definitely would have to be in my top six. <laughs> no, that's that perfect, no, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And so um, <laughs> speaking of that, you know, we, we, we also have one of the, the, the um, if not the most endearing part of the film festival to me is that we have the educational component, which is the, the OK Cine Latino Film Institute. Uh, now we're going on our, um, on our fifth year. And it's just amazing to see these young uh, filmmakers as, as I like to call them, because there are filmmakers, you know, nowadays, you know, we, we we live, we live in the age of technology and everyone has a smartphone, which in essence, you know, that makes you a filmmaker. You know, you have applications that you can edit movies in your phones. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, uh, TikTok, YouTube, uh, Instagram, everything's on your phone and you can edit, you can even edit on your phone. So, um, uh, so to, to me and, you know, to everyone, you know, in, in our team, I think the Institute is one of the most important parts of aspects of the, of the film festival having you know uh, uh, an educational component and so can you speak to that as far as uh, what is the um, importance of having an institute of, 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 of filmmakers here in, in the festival oh it's very important you know i had had i had something like that when i was their age i would have been all of all for you i would have been all about it um i, I would have been desperate to, i was desperate to do something like that um, I, I have some, some films that I have some, I shouldn't say films, right? They were, they're videos, right? They're 30 frames per second. <laughs> and, uh, they, uh, that I created, um, even as a teenager. So I, cre I created an animation when I was 14, um, using a VHS camera. Um, my dad helped me and, um, and whenever it, it was frustrating because I was drawing drawing things frame by frame, and what it was is a person jumping off of a diving board and slamming into a brick wall, like they jumped too hard and hit the wall. So it was supposed to be like slapstick comedy, right? And so it was just a brief animation, but you know, drawing frame by frame by myself. Um, and so what we kind of we kind of gave up, and as we were making that, we switched over to try to do um, comedy sketches. So I'm 14 years old. And my two younger brothers are helping me and my dad's recording it on a VHS camcorder. And we did like um, a parody of, of, of uh, like some mystery movie, like um, what am I trying to say? Like um, not a mystery, but you know, like a, um, what do they call the genre of uh, like Chinatown? Film noir, it was, it was mystery film noir, okay? So we did a parody of that. I still have that, I'm, I'll show it to you one day. Um, so that was. That I think was that needs to be submitted to the festival, <laughs> right? That was 1993. Yeah, and it, it, it was just a short little sketch um, that we, you know, we did for fun. Uh, whenever, whenever I was in um, in high school, instead of like instead of submitting an essay, sometimes we were allowed to create videos as a as a response, an essay to whatever question we were doing, whatever topic we were covering. So we had we all had to do a history fair project instead of a science fair. It was a history fair. So I did um, I put together a group of people and we created a documentary about Cesar Chavez. This was in like 1995, 1996. So um, I'm thankful to um, the teachers there, you know, supporting us for the idea. So I got together a group of people, and at my high school, class and school of advanced studies, there weren't like a lot of Hispanic students. So we had to recruit some non-Hispanic students to be to be migrant workers in the in the field and at the and during strikes doing strikes 
So we had, and that was pretty good. Like that was like a 10 minute short film about Cesar Chavez. And I have that still too on VHS. And what was interesting is that we had to edit that, you know, on a, on a linear editor, old school um, VHS tapes at once. And, um, and I was able to use that because of the film teacher at Classical School of Advanced Studies who let us go to her house. She had this film editing set up at her house. This was before nonlinear editing. And we were there hours and I could tell, you know, she was getting like, you know, she was ready to go to bed. But, no, 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 I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Like, I'm, I gotta get this right. You know, adding titles, um, trying to uh, fix uh, bad cuts, you know, here and there trying to go through all the takes to find the right take. Um, so all I'm trying to say is, is that I, I, know, I know what it's like to not have, to want to do these kind of things and not have all the tools that you want, that you really need in front of you, right? And you make do with what you can. So if you could compare what I felt and went through when I was in high school and compare that to what these high school students um, are wanting to do and maybe feel in their heart, um, it's, it's awesome to think that they have this excellent opportunity to learn from geniuses like you and Victor um, and everybody else who's helped. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity that I would have loved to have had. Stuff that I tried to do even when I was in high school in the 90s. And, uh, and if you could see them, like when you see these, I wanna show them to you. They're not very well made, right? And, uh, but you know, you do what you can with what you, with what you have. And, uh, and I know that you know, these, these students that are participating, um, I'm glad that they're taking advantage of it. You know, they all have a story to tell. They have something to say. Uh, they're giving a voice to people uh, who, who can, can identify with them. And, uh, and it's, it's amazing, man. It's, it's, it's life changing. Um, you know, even if they don't end up doing anything at all in media in the future, the things that they're learning will still apply to whatever field that they go into. Things such as pre-planning, um, resource allocation, deadlines. You got you got to do that whether you're whether you're a doctor, whether you're a Wall Street investor, or if you're if you're going to be a film director. So uh, it's amazing, you know, um, the fact that they get to do this. And yeah, to me, it's magic. And you're giving them such a huge opportunity. And I'm glad that they're taking advantage of it. No, oh, thank you so much. And yes, that's one of the things that you know we enjoy the most. You know, being able to. Uh, just kind of plant that seed on, 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 on these high school age students. Uh, because you know, just like you said, you know, uh, they may not, you know, go into the field of filmmaking, but they may be able to use these same skills because these are life skills, you know, just like everything else in life. And they may be able to use this in, 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 in a job, you know, that not necessarily may end up being filmmaking, but, but still, you know, uh, it's, it's still life skills that they can use, you know, later on in life. Uh, so we're coming down to an end to this interview. Uh, thank you so much for your time. But before we, we leave, um, I want to ask you, what, would, what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers? Oh, wow. Advice to aspiring filmmakers. Well, one, one, one thing I, I like to tell everybody, and I think this applies for young filmmakers as well, is that there's only two people on this planet that you should compare yourselves to. I think it's easy for us to say, man, I'm already... 22 years old and I haven't created a, a, a feature length film like I wanted to, like Roy has an award winning feature length film. And uh, I'm 25, I still haven't done a feature length film. I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do it? I wanna do this. You know, it's easy to compare yourself to other people and uh, to think, man, you know, they have what I want. They got it before I did. And comparing ourselves to other people, keeping up with the Joneses sometimes, right? But that's that's not, we should be careful when we do that because their journey is different from our journey and we only see the present. We don't see their past. We don't see their future. So there's only two people on this planet that you should compare yourself to the person that you used to be and the person that you want to become. Those are the only two people that you should compare yourself to the person that you used to be and the person that you're trying to become. And if you stay focused on that, you're going to do well. Um, if you don't get distracted by all these other things, and something else I'd like to say in terms of advice is it matters a lot who you associate your stuff with. Um, you know, if you have a, a dream that you're trying to accomplish, maybe, you know, like I said, if your dream is uh, to be a filmmaker and you want to stay in this industry, 
you need to associate with people who have either the same dream or who are already doing it. Because, you know, there's a famous saying in Spanish, and I think it's true, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres, right? And you, it also gets said in the, in the self-help world, in the business world, uh, you know, the, the five people that you spend the most time with are going to influence what it is that you actually do. And I think there's a lot of truth to it because, and I feel like this, this is something that I've gotten with my friendship, my, my friendship with you, Roy, is that I've learned a lot from you by being, being your friend and the things that you know that I, that I didn't know uh, about filmmaking, about anything. And, uh, um, you know, having you as a friend helps that, helps that part of me, that, that dream that, that I had, and, um, you know, it, 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 helped, it helped feed it and grow it. Like even to this day, Every time I think of Codex, I think of you. I hear your voice in my head when I'm when I'm when I'm editing a video, when I'm exporting a video. I hear I hear I hear Roy's voice in my head talking about Codex, talking about H264, talking about Sorensen, and uh, you know something that you know it's very important part of of, of, of filmmaking of, of editing, um, and you know I, just tons of things that I've learned from Roy. So if you hang out with other people that have the same interests as you, the same goals as you do, it's going to rub off and, and make it better. Um, and also those are the people that um, are gonna help you to build what you want and to build because it's easy for us to get discouraged when we, when we bounce ideas or when we talk about our dreams with people who are not in that world, they don't get it and it's hard for them to relate. And it's, and it's even if they do it accidentally, they can discourage you. And with, you know, even if they don't do it on purpose by saying things like, oh, you'll never make money doing that. Um, why don't you get a real job? Um, I mean, there's so many ways that you can make money. There's so many different avenues, so many different things that are associated with you can you can make a living doing these things um, in the filmmaking world. Uh, and you know, sometimes you don't even have to leave Oklahoma City to do it. You'll probably hear that a lot. Get out of Oklahoma City. Um, you know, the, we could argue that all day, but other people have done it, and you know, Oklahoma City is, is growing in that area too. We didn't, we didn't even talk about that, but. Um, with with the way things are changing and even now with the pandemic, yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunities he, even here in Oklahoma City for filmmaking and getting a job in the future. So so don't give up, stay persistent. Um, Charlie Chaplin, you know, the famous filmmaker himself, the actor, once said, "The world belongs to those who go after what they want." So if you go after it and you don't give up, you get what you want. Wow, I can't top that off. <laughs> I think with, with <laughs> we, we we can we can happily part with this with the, with with your advice. I think that is one of the greatest advice I, I could ever hear. You know, I think it's amazing. Uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being part of Okisin Latino Film Festival for being part of uh, Historic Capital Hill at Calle Dos Cinco. Um, you know, it's just a joy to have you as a friend. You know, personally, I thank you so much for oh, that okay. friendship and uh, for being part of Okisin Latino. To me, it's just like you know, we, we need to have a great home and. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, thank you, bro. We'll definitely, we'll definitely, you know, hopefully, you know, once this pandemic, you know, is is over, you know, we're able to hang out again, and and hopefully next year, you know, yeah. we'll be in person, so you know, we'll we'll be able to see more Latino films at the Yale Theater, you know, like we used to do in the past, like your parents did, you know. So uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, and I want to I want to make more money so I can so I can donate more and you know scholarships. I need more money to be able to. <laughs> to make to do more film, to do more film projects to donate more to the festival and to donate more to get scholarships for these students so they can go to film programs here in the in, in the state so and yeah what, what a big compliment to hear you say those to say they say those things about me because uh because i admire you very much Roy. you are the man <laughs> you are the man with the plan i'm just the, awesome. i'm just the man that knows the man <laughs> uh, yeah right Oklahoma is better because you're here, because you served our country in the army and because of what you're doing for our community, you are making Oklahoma better, brother. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your kind words. Appreciate it, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, with that, I think we're gonna have to uh, you know, see you guys later. You know, this has been an amazing uh, uh, time, you know, for for, for, uh, for Opus and Latino Film Festival and to be able to have you on, on, on I, call, I call it the show. I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a movie show. <laughs> <laughs> so, a TV show, you know. So, thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been another OK Cine Latino interview series. 
Uh, and of course, you know, please make sure to join us in all of our social media at OKC and Latino. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and that's where, where, you, would get, where you would get the latest updates, you know, for the festival. And of course, you know, festival 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Uh, make sure to check us out. And of course, you know, stay tuned for everything that's coming up and, 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 and the Film Institute, you know, stay tuned for more dates and for more uh, workshops, you know, with the students. So if you're a parent and that you need to, you know, if you if your kid or your your your, um, your your kids have you know an interest in filmmaking, please tell them about this this amazing uh, um, uh, institute, uh, OKC Latino Film Institute. You know, and it's just we're just so happy to be able to provide this opportunity for our young you know, uh, high school students. And so, yes, thank you so much, Greg, again for for being here with us, and we'll see you guys later. And stay tuned for OKC Latino seventh annual virtual film festival.